in the woods Morning guys, Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School. I appreciate you joining me back here for another video this morning. Um, what we're going to talk about today a little bit is we're going to talk about knives. Knives are a very touchy subject anywhere on the internet just like guns are. But what we're going to talk about today is I want to show you the three typical knife profiles or designs that were really used as a mainstay along the frontier from 1700 basically through the mid 1800s. And I want to show you what those typical knife designs were, talk about the companies that made them, talk about some of the traders that carried them, how many of them they carried, which ones were traded with the Indians, which ones weren't, which ones were used on a daily basis, why they were designed the way they are, and also what we can bring forward from that or what has been brought forward from that in history that we see that those designs are still being used today and they're just been modified a little bit. So let's talk about that today. And we're gonna start off with what I got on the table here and what I got on the board. And I hope I don't go too fast for you. I'll try to keep my drawings the best I can. I'm not an artist by any means. So we'll just have to do the best we can. Okay guys, um, Gene Hickman wrote a very good article about knives from 1700 to the mid 1800s because he was trying to do a reenactment or trying to do a portrayal of Lewis and Clark. So he called around to a lot of companies in England that supplied knives for US trade during the 1700 to the mid 1840s to understand what knife would have been typical for them to carry. And what he's found out in his research is there were really three profiles that were very typical along the frontier that were shipped over here from England by companies like Sheffield and also made by companies like Wilson and those two companies are named in several historical journals of the knives that were used and traded with the Indians as well as sold by merchants and mercantiles along the frontier. The first one is called the butcher knife and if you picture a butcher knife from today like a Green River um, or something like an old hickory very very similar. Subtle changes that we'll talk about in a few minutes. The second one was called the French and this knife also went by several other names. French trade knife is the most common. The third style knife was called the cartouche and I can't find anything on the internet that tells a translation of that word to something else. So I assume it's just a type of knife but it was very similar to what you see today as a fancy kitchen knife. If you picture a steak knife without the serrated blade that would have been a cartouche. All of these knives very typically had basically slab handles on them. Some of them were full tang, some of them were not. Basically the full tang ones were a little more expensive. Those were not typically the ones traded to the Indians. Typically they were given the cheaper stuff that was non-full tang. So they could have had some type of a rat tail tang in them or a small slab style tang like this. Or they could have been full tang design like what you see today. One of the important things to understand about knives back in that period was they didn't have the same attachment devices that we have today for attaching knife handles to a knife. So even if they had a full tang knife with slabs on both sides, they didn't have these great big brass rivet pins in them that we use today and screws and things like that. So typically they would have anywhere between three and six pins in the handles that were made of brass or iron. So you'd have one, two, three, four, five or sometimes six evenly spaced pins in that handle and I'll kind of show you a typical design like that in a few minutes for a knife I've got on the table. The other thing to understand about the butcher knife is is that in the 1700s until the mid 1800s or early 1800s the knife design basically was the handle was the same width as the blade. So what you see today in different handle designs and things like that that contour away from the shape of the blade are not typical of what was found along the frontier. Most of them had a handle the same width as the blade. The butcher knife widened out a little bit at the nose toward, you know, the, uh, I, won't, I don't want to say mid-1800s, but by 1825, 1830, and it's starting to widen out, and we'll talk a little bit about that when it comes to Nesmic here in a few minutes, because I think his knife design 
very much came from the butcher knife and we'll talk about that we'll also talk about why the butcher knife was designed the way it was and what's so good about a butcher knife for its intended purpose which was butchering game and that's what they all used their knives for was self-defense or butchering game they didn't use these for carving they used small class folding style knives and there's hundreds and hundreds of dozens of those in trade journals throughout the 17 1800s of both folding knives and what they call clasp knives to be used as a whittling tool. These were for self-defense or for skinning game pretty much period. Now the French style knife and the butcher knife both were known on the frontier in different time periods in different places as a scalping knife. And the reason they were called a scalping knife basically was because they were sold into the Indian trade. So they called them a scalping knife. But typically from what I've read in historical journals, the butcher knife was much more common along the frontier, much more commonly sold to Indians than the French trade knife was, at least once the frontier started to move west past Illinois. French knives were also very common in eastern woodlands, as was the butcher. The cartouche really is third. I see, a, I see the cartouche being advertised a lot of places as the typical woodland knife of the period. And it's really not. According to the journals that I've read, the cartouche is a very distant third as far as general design goes and importation of that knife to be sold into trade. The French knife and the butcher knife far exceed that. The butcher knife far exceeds the French knife um, once you get into periods of Western development. So we'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Okay, so real quick, guys, um, we'll talk about some historical references on things, too, but I want to kind of walk you through these knives really quick and kind of show you what I'm talking about without the funky pictures that I draw on the board. First of all, understand that none of the knives on this table really would depict a period-style knife, mainly because most period-style knives of the 1700s to at least the mid-1800s would have had just a slab handle that basically was square and the corners were shaved off to make it more like an octagon shape. So this knife here is very typical of the profile of a butcher knife of the 1700s. It's a little bit on the thick side. Most of theirs were about 5 30 seconds. This one's probably close to 3 16 but not quite. But it has two pins here and it would have had five. More like this knife has five. It has one, two, three, four, five. And again, it has a rounded handle, not a square handle. So it's not really indicative of what knife they would have carried, although the blade profile of this French trade knife is very indicative of the blade profile of a French trade knife or what was sometimes called a scalpel or a scalper, excuse me. But the butcher knife was more often referred to as a scalper. And if you look, you know, there are Scalpers were described in historical journals as any cheap butcher knife that was traded to the Indians. So that tells me that this was more of a typical scalping knife or what they call a scalper than this was. This was more often called the Frenchman, the French trade knife, or basically a French kitchen knife. And that is the profile design, blade, and everything else that the Pathfinder knife was designed after. If you look at a Pathfinder knife next to that knife, they're almost identical in blade profile and design. The Pathfinder has a little bit longer handle on it because I felt this one was a little bit short. It has a little bit thicker blade on it so that it could be used if it had to be for a one tool option. Whereas this one's made out of a saw blade. So it's very thin, very much more typical of what they would have had back then to work with or what they would have used was a very thin blade. There's a tick right there crawling across my handle. I'll have to take care of him real fast here. There we go. Okay. And this knife over here would have also been very typical of what they would call a French design in that it was straight across and didn't have any dip in it. Some of the knives had a little bit of a dip in them, some of them didn't. Most of them were straightforward like this. This one dips a little bit and it's also typical of a combination French style knife and a butcher knife. This knife is a Nesmic and you can see that it's very reminiscent of a butcher knife and I think there's a reason for that that we'll talk about in a second. In 1826, the ledgers from Jedediah Smith, who was a trader along the frontier, he ordered certain things for his trading operation. One of the things that he ordered was a knife. 
and he only had one type of knife in his inventory, and he had dozens and dozens of these knives, and he called them the butcher knife. That was what they were called. Sometimes they were numbered. Sometimes they were listed in inches as far as how long the blade was. But it was referred to as a butcher knife. And I would say that it was this style design most likely. Lewis and Clark, when they took their epic journey, they bought four dozen butcher knives. And they're specifically called out as butcher knives. They bought four dozen of them for their journey. Again, like I said, some of them were full tang, some of them were half tang, or excuse me, partial tang or rat tail tang. It would just depend on the maker of the knife and what the use for that knife was. In an 1830 trade invoice um, shipped by steamboat on the Upper Missouri River, there are accounts of number 2634 and a 7-inch butcher knife. And both of those knives were carried on that steamboat in 50 dozen quantities. In 1730, or excuse me, in 1837, the Fitzpatrick and Company inventory lists 84 dozen scalpers, which again could have been a knife like this, or could have been just a cheap butcher knife. 17 dozen seven-inch butcher knives made by a company called Wilson, and 16 dozen cartouche knives. And the cartouche knife is the one I really don't have a good example of. But like I said, if you look at a typical steak knife, a larger steak knife of today's industry that would be very reminiscent of the blade profile of a cartouche knife the sheffield company in england from 1700 to 1800 shipped hundreds of dozens of butcher knives what they called butcher knives in two or three different stock numbers which probably stood for length to both north america and africa for trade now as i said later on in the period you know, around the beginning of the 1800s, 1830, 1840, 1820s, somewhere in that neighborhood, the butcher knife widened out a little bit at the top and was made the blade wider than the, or thicker, the width was bigger than the width of the handle. That's where I think Nesmic came up with the design of his now famous Nesmic style knife. I think it was designed after a later period butcher knife. Nesmic was a very smart woodsman, and he would typically only use tools that were designed for the purpose. He designed his tools to be very purpose-specific, including the double-bit axe that he had made. And when he designed his knife, I think he designed it very specifically after a butcher knife because that's what he planned on doing with it. He didn't use this knife for batoning wood. He didn't use this knife to process firewood. He used a folding knife for carving that had two blades on it. He used a double bit axe for his splitting and some of his skinning needs, boning and things like that. And then he used a butcher knife to do his butchering. And I've butchered probably well over a hundred animals. And I would have to say that the butcher style design is very purpose specific. And I think it's important to understand that so that we know where knives come from and why they're designed the way they are and why they were so popular in you know, times along the frontier. And it's because they were designed for a specific purpose that they were going to be used for every day. Those guys butchered animals all the time. If you look at the design of a butcher knife, it has this rounded top on it. That's very typical even of butcher knives today. And I think the reason for that is, is that when you stick that knife underneath the skin of an animal and you're cutting with it, it tends to ride here higher as it goes along the the inside of the animal, where the bone may be or where the muscle may be, and it tends to act like a zipper to lift and split the skin open as it rides. And I think that's exactly why Nesmic designed his knife the way he did, was because it would become like a zipper for opening up game and for skinning it out for food. If you look at a French-style knife like the Pathfinder or like this one, it's not going to do that for you. This point would tend to get caught if you weren't putting your finger underneath it or lifting it or assisting it somehow, it doesn't have that ability to lift itself up off the muscle or the bone like a butcher knife does. So this is more of a meat carving tool, whereas this is more of a butchering tool. And I think that's why the butcher knife was so popular along the frontier for so many years. Well, guys, I thank you for joining me today with this short discussion about knives from you know, the 1700s to the mid-1800s. I think it's important for experimental archaeology's sake to look at the different profile designs of knives that were used, why they were used, and what their specific 
purposes were because if we're talking about sustainability or long-term survival situations, we need to understand that you use specific tools for specific tasks. Now, there's nothing wrong with the one tool option in case I lose everything else, but at the same time, you need to make sure that that one tool option will do the things you need it to do as best it can. That's why I designed the Pathfinder knife. It's not the perfect knife for butchering, but it was used for that purpose all over the frontier. But again, the butcher knife was designed for that purpose. It will do other things well, and you can buy them very cheap even to this day. And a discount kit is what some people need in this day and age, in this economy that we have. And old hickory butcher knives can be had for a couple bucks at any thrift store all over the United States. And as long as you have the other accoutrements to go with them, that are solid, like an axe, like a saw, like a folding knife, you can get away with, you know, some simple butcher knife like that very, very easily. I thank you for joining me for this video today. I thank you for everything that you do for me, for my family, for my school. I appreciate your views, and I thank you for the time you take to watch my videos and comment on my videos. I'm Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School, and I'll be back with another video as soon as I can.